ali wa ashabi wa man istanna bi sunnati la yawm din all praise due to allah may allah's great blessings be on his last prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day <coughs> This session, inshallah, uh, what we'll be looking at is textual harmonization. That is, we have a number of different statements coming from Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu through a number of different sources. We looked at the issues of uh, authentication. Now, if we have confirmed, right, we have texts where hadiths appear to contradict each other. Now what do we do in those circumstances? If we have deter- First thing we should determine that in fact we are dealing with authentic texts. Because if we have one which is authentic and one which is not authentic, then it's not the issue of contradiction here. You just get rid of the one which is not authentic. So the one authentic hadith is really the fact. So, uh, the first step, of course, is to verify, if we if contradicting hadiths are brought to us, is to verify that they are both authentic. There is a scholar by the name of Al-Tahawi, who wrote a book called Mushkil Al-Athar, or the Problematic Narrations. And this is what he did. He gathered uh, all of the hadiths which were apparently contradicting each other and gave explanations as to why etc etc clarifying what was the case where it was a case of a weak hadith or uh, it was a case of you know uh, general and specific or whatever he clarified or harmonized uh, the, uh, the the hadith now the basic principle uh, to be followed is that we try to unify the texts that is that we try to work with both texts rather than to cancel one and only work with the other as a basic principle the first step should be what is called jama bringing the two texts together meaning to find a way of applying both without cancelling one or the other and what we uh, what we do the process once we combine the text actually this is a uh, The, the methods when we're dealing with combination or combining text, the main method is to identify which text is a general text and which text is a specific text. Meaning, one text makes a general ruling and the other one speaks about a specific circumstance. Once you're able to identify this, if you're able to identify this, then you're able to work with both texts at the same time. For example, Prophet Muhammad Sallam had forbade the for, for anybody to make prayers after Salatul Fajr until sunrise. And after Salatul Asr until sunset. Right? At the same time, he also said, إِذَا دَخَلَ أَحَدُكُمُ الْمَسَاجِدِ If any of you goes into a mosque, فَلَا يَجْلِسْ حَتَّى يُصَلِّ رَكْعَتَيْنِ He should not sit down until he has prayed two units of prayer. So now, what do we do in a circumstance like this? One hadith says, if you go in the mosque, which means anytime, if you go in the mosque, then you should pray before you sit down. 
and the hadith where Prophet said, no prayers after Fajr until sunrise, after Asr until sunset. How do we harmonize these two? Well, what the scholars have done, of course, there were two approaches. Some scholars said the hadith of praying two units before sitting is the general hadith. It's a general statement. And the hadith which said you don't pray after Fajr until sunrise and after Asr until sunset, this is the specific hadith. Meaning, Whenever you went to the masjid, you pray to before sitting unless it is after Fajr until sunrise or after Asr until sunset. This was one approach. Other scholars said, no, it is the opposite. The general hadith is you don't pray after Fajr until sunrise, Asr until sunset, unless you have just entered a masjid. If you have just entered the masjid, this is a specific circumstance. If you just enter the masjid, whenever you just enter a masjid, then you will pray, even at these times. These are two approaches. Now the question is, which one was the general and which one was the specific? How do you resolve it? Because it is possible to look at these hadiths in both these ways. What did Allah say? وَإِن تَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَرُدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ If you have a dispute, a disagreement about something, as in this case, what do we do? We take it back to Allah and His Messenger. So we now go back to the Quran and the Sunnah to find out what is the solution for this. And we find Aisha reporting that on one occasion after Asr, Prophet Muhammad prayed two rakah. And she asked him, what is this two rakah? You told us not to pray after Asr. And he said, these were the two sunnas for Dhuhr, which was to be done after Dhuhr. However, a delegation came to see me and we got busy. I was not able to make the two, so I'm making them now. So we see that a, if you have missed a prayer, you can do it at that time, meaning that this is a prayer which has been specified. Not a compulsory prayer now, still recommended, but it has a specific instruction regarding it. It has been recommended. Such a prayer can be done then. Furthermore, there is an authentic narration that after Fajr, a man got up to pray. The Prophet ﷺ asked him, what are you doing? And he said, these were the two sunnas of Fajr which I missed. And he let him go ahead. So again, confirmation that where there was a specific purpose or specific instruction with regards to those prayers, these prayers may be prayed even with, with, after the, uh, Fajr and after Asr. This was the confirmation, this was the support. So the Sunnah then goes and clarifies for us, you know, which one is the general and which one is the specific. Now there's another hadith in which Prophet ﷺ had forbidden prayer at the time of the rising of the sun and at the time of the setting of the sun and when the sun is in the middle of the sky or in the middle of its movement through the sky. These times. Now the Sahaba said Prophet ﷺ forbade us from prayer at these times and he even forbade us from burying our dead at these times. 
So now, why don't we come in for prayer to the masjid and it's the time of the rising or the setting of the sun or it's in the middle. What do we do? Do we take this again to be a general statement and we still apply our two raka? No. We don't in this case. Because the companions clarified that they were not even permitted to bury the dead at that time. It means this is a, it's a, this is a major prohibition. Not like the other one. This was a major prohibition. That we should not do so. Therefore, to begin a prayer at that time, at the time of the setting, is not permissible. Not permissible. Furthermore, we have authentic narration from the Prophet ﷺ that he said, if you can catch a raka before the rising, right? In other words, you got up late, and you have enough time to be able to catch one unit of prayer before the rising, you can do so. Go ahead. It means that your second unit is being prayed when? While the sun is rising. So it's clarified in that narration that you are not permitted to begin a prayer at that time. But if you have already begun a prayer and the rising takes place or the setting takes place, then that doesn't affect your prayer. This is the point. So, whenever we're going to analyze hadith when they come together, we have to bring all of the different hadiths on the topic as they give us direction and clarification as to whether certain hadiths are general, certain ones are specific, you know, how we can work with both hadiths together. Because once we harmonize them in this way, between the general and the specific, it means we're going to apply both hadiths. One will take precedence over the other at a particular point, but in general you're still applying both hadiths. And this is the ideal situation. Whenever we find hadiths, we should try to uh, work it this way. Now, you may find hadiths where uh, the Prophet Sallallahu is described in prayer as doing more than one thing, sitting in more than one different way. In these cases, where there is variation in the Prophet Sallallahu actions, though he said, pray as you saw me pray, if he prayed in more than one different way, then you can also pray in more than one different way. So we don't look at that as being contradiction, right? Or they call it uh, unresolvable contradictions. But instead these are variational contradictions where there are a variety of different things which Prophet did and you may choose to do any one of them and they don't act against each other. Where there are other contradictions where one says you can, the other one says you can't. And this is where we have, these cannot exist at the same time. One has to take precedence over the other. Right? The second issue that may arise uh, That means, Dr. the prayer that we need there we can pray after Salatul Asr. Yes. But if there is no missed prayer, you are not obliged to pray inside the masjid when you get inside the masjid during that time. No, you do. Because that prayer has a reason. There is an instruction to do it. So they call it a Salah that a Sabab. You know, a prayer which has a cause. Meaning what prayers are not allowed at those times are just Prayers which just come from yourself. You feel like praying. No special reason, no special instruction to pray, but you just feel what they call, you know, just a, 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 um, a general invol a, you know, voluntary prayer that you're doing from yourself, which has not been prescribed, recommended, or anything. You're just coming from yourself to like, feel like praying and you pray. That prayer, that type of prayer is not permitted at that time. But where there is a cause, 
there is a specific instruction from the sunnah to do this prayer, there is reward in it, etc., etc., then you can do it at those times. That is the time between the prayer and the rising and the prayer and the setting. But not at the time of the rising, at the time of the setting. Those we're not allowed to do unless we are making up, for example, a far prayer where we are able to catch at least one rak'ah before the rising begins, then we, our setting begins. The other uh, approach for harmonizing the hadith text will be also when we have a statement, well, we, we have what they call a hadith, which is a hadith qawli, where there is a statement of the Prophet ﷺ, and a hadith fairly, where there is an action of the Prophet ﷺ. He said one thing, and he did something else. And, and they seem to contradict each other. What do we do under these circumstances? How do we resolve it? The general principle that the scholars have agreed upon, the majority anyway, is that the statements of the Prophet ﷺ take precedence over his actions. The statements, the instructions, take precedence over the actions. Why? Why not the other way? Because of the fact that the action of the Prophet ﷺ may be something unique to himself. It may be something unique to himself. For example, he forbade wisal, which is a 24-hour fast. He forbade it. Wisal. But he himself did it. But he did it. But you can find narrations where he clarified, saying, don't do it because Allah sustains me. Allah provided him sustenance where other people would not find. Meaning, he could fast continually like that for one week, two weeks, three weeks. And Allah would provide him with sustenance. Miraculous, Whereas, you and I, if we tried to do that, we would be dead after a week. So, in order to protect us from ourselves, he forbade us from fasting the 24-hour fast. So, this is a case where his statement takes precedence over his actions. However, oh, I'll give another example to where the Quran said, and this is being related by him, the Quran, that a man may marry two, three, or four women, right, of his choice. If he can't be just, then he should only marry one. But Prophet Muhammad was married to nine at a time. Again, that was something special for him. We know it was special for him because those companions who accepted Islam in Medina, who had more than four wives, he told them, choose four and divorce the rest. Choose four and divorce the rest. So, this is something special for him. And there are a number of other things of this nature. At the same time, there could be between his uh, statement and his action, A clarification that 
a prohibition or a command was not meant to be taken as a command but as a recommendation not as a prohibition but again as something better not done uh, where Prophet you know commanded certain things and he forbade certain things in language a command may mean compulsory something compulsory you must do it or it may mean it's good for you to do it recommend it right? in the language in any Arabic language or in other languages the basic understanding of a command is that it is in fact compulsory that is the foundation for commands that they are compulsory if we don't accept that and there are some people who argue no the foundation for commands is that it's something recommended if we don't go from that position then the society would fall apart meaning if the boss on the job tells you you're the secretary write this letter now if you stop and think does he mean I have to write it or is he just advising me to write it hey the business is going to fall apart the business is based on a set a chain of command when the authority instructs the one under to do something it means you've got to do it that's what it means if you don't take that as the general meaning then you have chaos right so this is why I say the basic meaning of a command is that it must be done the basic meaning of a prohibition is that it must not be done absolutely do not do it however that command to do or not to do may also be used to indicate it's good for you to do or good for you not to do I mean I can say or your boss can say to you it's good to eat an egg in the morning before you come to work it gives you strength no. he can say it in the phrase eat an egg in the morning before you come to work but is he really saying you must eat an egg every morning before you come to work it's a recommendation okay. it's a recommendation here how did you know that he was recommending you when he told you to eat an egg and he was ordering you when he told you to write the letter the circumstance your home is your domain he can't tell you what to do in your home right? this is not the area of his authority he's no longer an authority there in your home in the job circumstance he is the authority so it is a question because a command from people who are on the same level don't, does not indicate must compulsory just as a command from a person who is a lower authority to a higher authority a command is a plea give me some money <laughs> this is not a this is not compulsory instruction right this is a plea right so the, depending on the position that the person is this is what is going to determine whether the command is a plea whether it is a recommendation or whether it is a clear instruction of compulsory nature so in the job circumstance the boss is the boss he is the higher authority commanding the lower so they must follow in the home circumstance you're your boss you're your, you run your own home he has no right to tell you what you should do in your home so he is now on the same level as you he can only recommend so the circumstances here by those circumstances I'm not saying that you sit down and do all this reasoning that we're talking about here now I mean it's just common sense tells you that 
Here, this is just a recommendation. There was a command. Now, similarly, Prophet Muhammad he did command certain things. He did prohibit certain things. And he clarified that these things were in fact not compulsory by his actions. By his actions, he complied, he confirmed that they were not compulsory. For example, when he gave the prohibition, do not drink or eat standing in Sahih Bukhari. If you find yourself eating or drinking standing, vomit it up. Yes. Very strong. Of course, in these times, in these times, that has become the norm. You know, this is a Western etiquette that has come amongst us, right? Where the idea of the fast food, you're eating on the run, right? You're eating with the left and the right. You know, all of these things, the Islamic etiquette has been destroyed by these Western cultural practices. <laughs> Where time is money. Right? It's the whole thing. You want to save time. So you eat on the run rather than sit down and complete your meal. No, you're going to be running, walking, whatever you're eating, drinking, the whole thing is going on. Prophet Sallallahu said, don't eat or drink standing. If you find yourself doing so, then vomit it up. That's pretty strong. However, in Hajj, the Prophet Muhammad stood up and drank Zamzam standing. The Sunnah for drinking Zamzam is to drink it standing. Right? Now, some scholars say, well, maybe it's just for Zamzam. This is the exception. Just for Zamzam. So the general rule is, don't drink or eat anything standing except for Zamzam. It's a possible interpretation, no? However, Ali ibn Abi Talib, he made wudu in the courtyard in Damascus. And when he finished making the wudu, he stood up, and took the rest of the water, and he drank it standing. And he said, I hear that people have been prohibiting the drinking standing, saying it is haram. However, it is not. So with the action of the Sahaba, because again, we're going to say, one might say, well that's Ali's opinion. <laughs> that's Ali radiallahu anhu, yeah, fourth caliph, but that was his opinion. The point is, where do we take our opinions from? Are our opinions better than their opinions? They are the ones who were there when the revelation came. Do they not know the intent of that revelation better than we do? So, Ali in doing that, clarified that the intent behind that instruction was a strong recommendation not to do this thing. A strong recommendation. Better you don't. Strongly better. Not just better, but strongly better you don't. We also find uh, another practice of the Prophet ﷺ in which he <coughs> didn't use to urinate standing. And it was his practice to urinate sitting. And of course, again, the Muslim world is tested by Western etiquettes where they brought these little toilets which you sit, stick on a wall and People who urinate, standing next to each other, their private parts are exposed to each other. All of this is forbidden. 
but this is that culture. Anyway, and Aisha had said that the Prophet ﷺ never urinated standing. And in fact, anybody who claims that he did is a liar. However, one of the companions who traveled with the Prophet ﷺ, and they went to a village, went with him outside of the village to the dump where companions who traveled with the Prophet ﷺ, and they went to a village went with him outside of the village to the dump where the people would dump their refuse and he stood up and urinated standing there. Now Aisha related what she knew. And what she knew it was not permissible. Never did it. She was so strong about it, she said whoever says it's a liar. But she wasn't with him 24 hours a day. And it's possible that another companion could have been with him and observed himself. Now, the next step is one of tarjih. That was what I rubbed off the board. That is giving preference to one narration over the other. Meaning you're going to cancel the functioning of one narration because of the other. They cannot two exist. Both cannot exist together. You're not able to harmonize them. So you have to cancel one and say this one is no longer. We're going to follow that one. Okay. Huh? We're gonna, I'm talking about now. <clears throat> what is the basis under which we can say this? We can say this if we have a hadith sahih. And we have a hadith hasan. And we have a hadith hasan li ghairihi, which was really da'if, which we elevated up to hasan. If we find that the hadith which we have elevated up from da'if to hasan li ghairihi, contradicts a hadith which is sahih, then the hadith sahih is given precedence over that daif. And they put the hadith in order. The top hadith is one recorded by both Bukhari and Muslim. The second is one recorded by Muslim, Bukhari alone. The third is one recorded by Muslim alone. Fourth is one which is, not, which is recorded by all of the Sunan, all four. Fifth, one which are recorded by Tirmidhi. And after that, they differ uh, amongst the Sunan, which are the strongest. Tirmidhi is the strongest of the four. Really, it's then Abu Dawood, then Nasai, and Ibn Majah is at the end. In fact, some scholars didn't even think including Ibn Majah, it was added later. And Darimi, they favored over Ibn Majah, because the Darimi is more authentic, it has more authentic hadiths than Ibn Majah. So, where texts cannot be resolved in this way, then this is what we are obliged to resort to. And it is assumed that this step that we're taking, in fact, is a result of abrogation. Really, this is the final method, which is a form of tarajir, where we are in fact finding that one hadith has been abrogated by another. Meaning that it came first, Prophet said, don't do such such a thing, then later on he said, you can do it. So the second statement cancels out the first. This is a process of abrogation. Now, how do we know 
when abrogation has taken place. First and foremost, we know it when the Prophet Muhammad himself clarified it. Abrogation has taken place. For example, there's a well-known hadith in which he said, I used to forbid you from visiting the graves. In the early days in Mecca, Muslims were prohibited from visiting the graves. Then he said, but now you should visit them because they are reminders of the hereafter. So he initially forbade it, then he later permitted it. Okay. There's a hadith which the Prophet had said, whoever eats camel's meat should make wudu. Whoever eats camel's meat should make wudu. Some people said it was abrogated. They said it was abrogated. That was in the early days, in the beginning. But when they are asked to produce the evidence of its abrogation, they can't find anything. There's no hadith which indicates that. Some said there's another hadith where Prophet said, when instructed, that if you eat anything which has been touched by fire, you need to make wudu. Hadith, where he said, if you eat anything which has been touched by fire, in other words, been cooked. If you eat any cooked food, you need to make wudu. Cooked, actually, it's cooked meat. You need to make wudu. So they said, and that hadith, we know, was abrogated because uh, if we have a statement from the Sahaba concerning, and there is a statement where Prophet said, uh, where Sahaba had said that the last of the instructions concerning foods touched by fire is that it was permissible to eat without making wudu. So one of the ways we can know that abrogation has taken place is by the statement of a Sahabi. The statement of the Sahabi clarifies that abrogation has taken place. It was an initial instruction, later cancelled. So they said, we know this is an abrogated command, that the one for the eating of the camel's meat was when eating things touched by fire was prohibited. You had to make wudu. So that was when that instruction was given. But, actually it's not logical. Because, if the Prophet had already said, anything touch, any meat touched by the fire, if you eat it, you have to make wudu. What does the need to say camel? It's already included. So it's not logical to claim that it was a part of that instruction. So, having not found any evidence to support it, then a story was fabricated which you will hear some people teaching quote as if it is true. They said, Prophet Muhammad was sitting with his companions and one of them passed wind and he had just eaten some camel's meat and he didn't want to embarrass him by singling him out and saying, you go make wudu. So he said, whoever eats camel's meat must make wudu. This is a fabrication. This is not true. There is no hadith, no statement of sahabi to support this. It may have started, you know, by some scholars saying, perhaps, you know, perhaps, there was somebody sitting there who had broken wind and just when she did. That was me. From perhaps it became a story which was narrated along with the Hadith to justify and explain why it is okay to eat camel's meat and not make wudu. But the fact of the matter is there is no evidence 
to indicate abrogation. Therefore, the correct position is that if you eat camel's meat, then you must make wudu before praying. The third method, as I said, the first method is the Prophet ﷺ informing us in himself that such a, that such a thing has been abrogated. The second method is where a Sahabi informs it, as in the case of things touched by fire, food touched by fire. Sometimes we can identify abrogation by time, meaning that one instruction was given at an early time and another instruction is given at a later time. So we know because there's a time gap that the later one will abrogate the earlier one if they're contradictory. And we have that in the case of the hadith in which Prophet ﷺ had said, the copper and the cupped have broken their fast. The copper and the cupped have broken their fast. What is a copper? Yes. Okay. Cupping is a practice of bloodletting. Bloodletting, right? In some societies, they get leeches to do the job. Right? They get a leech, grow them big ones, and then they put it on you, suck the blood until it gets full and it drops off, and then the job is done that way. Right? It was the practice. No leeches around in Arabia. So the practice in Arabia was that they would place a cup-like instrument on some part of the body right? and they would remove the air from inside of it. There are different ways. Some of them uh, burnt uh, some material which uses up the air so it creates a vacuum. Some of them by sucking on it until... and some would aid the process by using a razor, something sharp, and making little cuts in the skin just to break the surface of the skin so the blood can come out more easily. When it's full, then they take away these cups. Anyway, initially Prophet Sallallahu had said that the copper and the cup have broken their fast. Both the one who had it done and the one who did it broke their fast. However, Ibn Abbas reported that the Prophet ﷺ cupped, was cupped while fasting in a state of ihram. He was in a state of ihram, fasting. We know that happened when? At the end of his life. Right. So this was the after the time of the conquest of Mecca. It's the last year of farewell pilgrimage. Prophet ﷺ did it. So we know that was the last. Uh, instruction or last act, so therefore it's looked at as abrogating the earlier. The other uh, way in which abrogation may be identified is if there is an ijma among the Sahaba, right? Ijma amongst the Sahaba that can indicate also abrogation, where. The Prophet ﷺ gave some instruction and the Sahaba unanimously did not apply that instruction. For example, Prophet ﷺ had said, hadith found in Sunan Abi Dawood, authentic, whoever takes intoxicants, whip him each time he's caught. But on the fourth occasion, kill him, execute him. not applied by the Sahaba. After the death of Prophet unanimously they didn't apply it. There were people caught drinking time and time again and it was not recorded that they and the righteous caliphs had anyone executed for drinking alcohol, for intoxication. So the unanimous practice of the Sahaba can indicate abrogation. The practice of a single Sahabi doesn't. But where it is unanimous among the Sahaba, then that may indicate 
abrogation. Okay? So these represent the basic methods of dealing with the rulings in the text themselves. When text contradicts, the first step is to confirm that they're both authentic. The second step is to try to harmonize them, bring them together by making one general, the other one specific. Or by uh, making one a command and a lesser command. A command which is modified, a modified command. Like Wajib going to uh, Mustahab or Makru going to, uh, sorry, Harab going to Makru. Modification, clarification. If there in general is a statement and an action, then the general rule is that statements take precedence over actions. Unless there are other supportive factors, explanations of the Sahaba, etc., which clarify the intent. If none of this is possible, then we go to Tarjiyah, that is, giving precedence to one hadith over another, based on the strength of the hadith itself, the strength of its chain of narration. Those which are most authentic take precedence over those who are less authentic. And then, the last step we have is abrogation, where we try to find evidence indicating that the ruling of a particular hadith has been cancelled. Okay? Inshallah. Uh, tomorrow, we will deal with the process of authentication, and we'll also deal with the Hadith Ahad. And this is a very important topic, Hadith Ahad, where people say commonly that you cannot use Hadith Ahad in Aqidah. We'll look into why they will say that a Hadith which may be authentic, fully authentic, however, it is classified as Ahad, and they say we can use it in our laws, in laws of economics or whatever other kind of laws, but we cannot use it in issues or to establish points of Aqidah. <coughs> okay, we'll just go on over and over to the questions. We have a bunch of questions here, some left over from yesterday, and inshallah, Inshallah, we uh, will try at least in the last session to finish off all of your questions. Having done wudu, suppose one is uh, someone eats garlic or onions. Does the person have to make wudu again or just gargle thrice? Well, they don't have to make wudu again, nor do they have to gargle thrice. If they want to try to uh, remove the smell or whatever, then it's better they should do that if they could. Otherwise, as the Prophet ﷺ said, if you eat raw garlic and onions, pray at home. Don't go to the masjid. What does it really mean by the Quran was revealed in seven different forms? Well, I wrote a book called Usul and Tafsir and it's explained there in detail. In fact, the previous course to this, this was tackled there. But just quickly to say that um, the Quran was revealed in accordance with the seven major dialects of the Arabs of Arabia, which was part of its miraculous character. So no one could claim that it wasn't revealed in their dialect, and that's why they couldn't imitate it. How far are we supposed to deal in destiny? We'll have to save that one for the end. Isn't the cupping incident of the Prophet to be taken as a 
cowl and fair, why not? Well, the point is that if the Prophet ﷺ does something and he does it openly, then the basic principle is that we can take uh, guidance from his actions. Where it is something which could be special to himself, then there will be some kind of supportive statement or explanation of the Sahaba, whatever, to clarify that it is unique to himself. Do you pray in two rakat when you enter the mosque, even if it's at the time of sunset? No. If it's at the time when the sun is setting, then you remain standing until it completes the setting. Different scholars give different religious verdicts and proofs to support their ideas or their views. We as laymen are unable to differentiate between the two views as to what is correct a correct verdict. For example, there are scholars who say that a woman shouldn't offer prayer with her hair tied in a bun. Because uh, all to them it gives the form of the hump of a camel. Well, actually, there is a hadith where the Prophet said, If you're praying and your hair is braided, it's tied up, then undo the braids and allow your prayer, your hair to prostrate along with you. However, this hadith is specific for men. It is specific for men. You said that when it's generally said it's for all sexes and this Yeah, right. So yeah, there's a general principle here. We said before that whenever hadith, when the Prophet said something, that we take it to be for both men and women. So why are we going to say this is specific now for men and not women? Why? Because women are obliged to wear khimar which stops their hair from prostrating along with them. So, it's clear that the hadith is specific for men. Now, the issue of the hump on the camel, right? if their hair is in a bun at the back of their head, I mean, this is not resembling a hump of a camel. What we're talking about is the hair which is piled up on top, which becomes, you know, uh, sticking up. This is something which is talked about by the Prophet ﷺ in the, in the times to come that the women will have their hair like this, you know. What was known as a hairstyle called the beehive, you know, way back in the 60s or whatever, you know. That is a, not an acceptable hairstyle for Muslim women. Otherwise, just tying your hair in the back of your head, there's nothing wrong with it. A woman should cover her head while eating. I do not remember the reason they gave. There is no evidence for this. A woman should go to her husband whenever he calls, regardless if she is, uh, whether she is fixed. I don't know. A reason given otherwise, the angel would curse her. This is true. This is a clear instruction from the Prophet. Even if she's at the oven, her husband calls her, she should. Uh, Comply. Oh, I mean, is it uh, about being on the camel, Sahih? I don't know about the camel. I just no said it the oven. On listening to a tape to help me with this class, I came across the following points that were not included in my notes. Perhaps I missed them. Please confirm the accuracy. Morsal hadith is the strongest type of weak hadith. 
but cannot be used as evidence alone. But it depends on whose morsel it is. Right? The morsel of the Sahaba, we said, is considered Sahih. The morsel of the Tabi'een, if it is a morsel from a Tabi'i who uh, was known only to narrate from the Sahaba, like Sayyid ibn al Musayyib, then it is accepted also as authentic. However, if it is not among those, then yes, that would be stronger as supportive evidence, a weak hadith, but supportive evidence, because the, the Tabi'een, if they are among the major Tabi'een, known reliable scholars, then their Mursal hadith will be considered stronger than other hadiths which are weak due to breaks in their chain, etc. For a hadith to be mu'allaq, the shaykh or, or the author and or more than him must be missing. That is the shaykh of Imam Bukhari. Yes, this is the mu'allaq hadith. It does not must be missing, but chunks from the, uh, the uh, narration have been dropped, leaving only the Sahabi at the end or just one before the Sahabi, something like this. For a hadith to be mu'adal, the two people missing from the chain must be consecutive. Yeah, two together. That's correct. Therefore, if the Sheikh or the author and the next person in the Senate is missing, this will be called a mu'adal mu'adal hadith. Well, every mu'allaq hadith is mu'adal, but not every mu'adal hadith is mu'allaq. In the tape, the shaykh also made a distinction between da'if and da'if jiddan. Please explain the implication for a simple example. He said, if an obscure person has only one known student, the hadith is classified as da'if. But if he has two or more students, then the hadith is da'if jiddan. That seems to be the opposite, I would say. Uh, the issue of da'if jiddan, I mean, this is a value, judgment. There could be a number of different factors why a scholar may say da'if jiddan, because there may be breaks in the chain, as well as weak narrators. This tells you da'if jiddan. And this may vary from scholar to scholar as to why he said da'if jiddan. He also said that for a hadith to be classified as hasan, the four conditions of continuity of chain, adala, nadshad, la illa must be met. The only difference between sahih hadith and hasan is with doubt that the narrator may have made that mistake. That's correct. contrary to my notes, maybe my mistake. He also mentions that, the, that with regards to Adala, a narrator who lies with regards to worldly affairs, his hadith are also classified as weak. Well, I didn't make any distinction between worldly affairs or uh, hadith. You know, if he's a liar, a known liar, then he's weak whether it's about worldly affairs, if he was known to be a liar, he's known to have lied. They didn't specify that it is specifically in regard to hadith, meaning if he lies about other things, he's okay, but if he lies, does, if, you know, we'll accept him for hadith. No. The term musnad also was mentioned several times as having two meanings, being a collection of hadith categorized by the companions narrating it. Please clarify the second meaning. Well, musnad, also means uh, something attributed back to the Prophet Muhammad that it has a complete uh, isnad it's being used in two ways if a statement of a sahabi can cancel a hadith then what is the explanation for statements of Ibn Abbas in which, when he was asked about women covering the face, 
He covered the whole face except one eye. This is not authentic. That's the explanation. Would the exam be multiple choice? <laughs> or question and answer type? I think most of us would prefer the former. <laughs> yeah, I prefer the former too. It's easier to mark. Okay, I think um, we'll save this last question here for tomorrow. It's quite long. So, inshallah, we'll close here now. Subhanakallah, wa bihamdika, ashadu wa ilaha wa and whilst he's answering the questions, he noticed that she is looking at 